Okay, recording is started. Welcome to the Manhattan GMAT Study Hall for the 15th of March 2012. Today's topic is the use of and as a connecting word. So we're going to do a little bit more of, this is the same topic as last week's study hall, two weeks ago. But we've got some more problems lined up. There was a sufficient stock of problems in the last study hall that we didn't get to to make another study hall. So that's what we're doing. There was actually not very many submissions this week either, which was another factor. Like not very many people actually submitted new things. So first we got to do the rules. Same rules we always have to do. Let's do them quickly. Submission guidelines, not too general not too specific, no personal issues, please. Remember that these recordings are watched by very large numbers of people, hundreds, sometimes thousands. So that's why we don't want personal issues. Like we don't want, hi, I have a 540 and I want a 700 and here's my history. And we have a place for that. It's on the forums in the general questions folder. Please don't submit things that are too general. I mean, you can't basically ask how does the GMAT work. And you can't ask about some super general class of problems that is way too much for one session. So, you know, the answer to how do I solve problems faster could be, you know, hundreds of pages long if you treated every problem type. So this is not really a feasible topic. Same thing, geometry is much too much of a topic for one study hall. So these are not good submissions. By contrast, on the other side of the coin, please don't submit problems that are too specific. Um, people are getting better about this, but if you just have one question about one specific problem, then please post it on the forum because that's why we have a forum. Like that's the reason for the existence of our forums is so that people can post single problems, single issues. So that's what that's for. What we want to see is intermediate depth. So this is one example. Today's example is the connector and, same as last time. One gentleman did submit a pretty nice topic about absolute values, so we may use that in the following session if I can find enough material to make a study hall out of. <coughs> so smiley face if you guys all understand these guidelines. No, not too general, not too specific, no personal issues. All right, this is a few smiley faces. Also, please no problems from the official guide. The, the GMAC crew has actually contacted us and made express requests of us that we not use official guide problems live. If there's a problem that's in the official guide that has also been put on GMAT prep software, then you can use it because GMAT prep is fair game. But if it's just from the official guide, that's a no-fly zone. So here's a few more examples. This person wrote an entire paragraph about official guide, but that means we just can't use it. Because remember, GMAC has officially requested that we not do that. So unfortunately, this person spent a lot of time typing a, a submission that we can't use. Also, please don't submit single questions. Here's one problem. Here's this one issue I had with it. Please post on the forum. Finally, please don't be rude. Um, if you guys do want to be business people in the internet age, then one thing you will definitely need is an exquisite sense of etiquette. And including learning what is rude and what is not rude if English is not your native tongue. I mean, for example, there are languages where you can say stuff like this. Um, for instance, in, in Spanish, there are words for I you know, am politely waiting for your reply. They're actually the same words as I expected. So there may be something lost in translation here. But doesn't matter in the long run, because you, if you're going to be doing business in English, then the ugly fact of the matter is that you have to understand what constitutes rude in English and what constitutes not rude in English, unfortunately. So make sure that you uh, are down with that. It will pay dividends more than just the GMAT. 
More examples. This is a personal study plan, and we we can't do these. Please don't submit them. Also, there's not a question. Some people have been doing this lately. They've just been kind of saying, here's what happened when I took the test, period, like a narrative. And I mean, great, you can tell a story, but you have to ask us a question. So I mean, please help me strategize, not really a question. This person is just saying, I scored lower than I thought. Can you help me? The answer is we can't help you unless you tell us a lot more information. So. Specifics on the forum, and then, you know, please don't also do stuff like this. We get a lot of submissions here. It's kind of like any sort of company that gets feedback. We get a lot of feedback, and there's exactly one person handling it here, which is me. And there's a lot more topics than we can use. We use one topic every two weeks, and we get a lot of submissions every two weeks. That means that most topics we will not use. In fact, if we get n topics, we will not use n minus one of them. So please understand that that's the that's the disadvantage of having a free product that is accessible to a lot of people is that we have to pick and choose. So any questions about this? If not, we will jump into the meat of today's class. Smiley face if this all makes sense. Smiley face icon. Sweet. Okay. Um, finally, please check the archives. I think people are doing this more, but it's still worth reiterating. We have about 50 some, I think there's more than 50 of these sessions in the archive now. What that means is that if you have any sort of generalized topic, it's probably in there already. So, for instance, I know there's at least one session on every major problem type in critical reasoning. And I know there's at least one session on every major problem type in reading comp. And I mean, by this point, we've covered a lot of ground. We've dug up a lot of dirt, so to speak. So please watch the videos that exist. That's why we post them on there. They're actually totally free, and there's like 50 of them. It's a great resource. But in other words, we don't want to see a submission that's like, hi, could you please discuss inference questions in reading comp? Because we already have two full sessions, that's three hours of, re of inference problems. So we would want you to watch that first, and then if there's anything about that issue that we have not covered, then tell us, you know, I watched the inference sessions and I didn't see X aspect of inference questions, so there's my submission. That works. So please check the archives. You know, basically do your due diligence, do your research. Um, any questions? If not, let's go ahead. Um, by the way, DK Littlejohn and others, when I say smiley face, I'm not talking about the chat box. I'm talking about there's an icon over there that's below the window with names. It's, it looks like an actual smiley button that you click on. So let's click on that if we're ready to go and do some problems. Click on the smiley face button, please. If you are ready to roll. Okay. So as mentioned previously, today's topic is the use of and as a connecting word. So this is last week's theme, uh, sorry, last session two weeks ago. This is the theme of two weeks ago as well. It is we still had a batch of unused problems because the discussion went in various directions last time. So, you know, continuation. When we put problems on the board, please do the following. You'll see multiple choice answers. They should have just appeared on your window. Those are what you should use to answer the multiple choice questions. If you are not new here, you will know this. But if you are new, please do not type answers in the chat box. That's kind of the equivalent of shouting out an answer in the middle of a class, which is sort of disruptive. But more to the point, it's going to influence other people's thought processes. To click the answer, you won't see anybody else's answer. Everybody will be able to do it independently. And then we will talk about it as a group. So also, please only click one time. This is not you know, Jeopardy where you have to keep clicking on the button. If you click it twice, it'll unclick the second time. So if you click an answer, one click. If you change your answer, one click on the new answer. 
So a smiley face if this all makes sense. Sweet. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. We're going to put some sentence corrections in the board. and But first, let's review. This is a continuation of last week. So without doing it in as much depth as last week, let's just do a quick review of what we learned about these things last week. Um, someone looks like they pressed the hand button. If you have a question, just type the question in the text box, please. So you don't need to raise hands. Um, OK, so what we learned last week, to, I keep calling it last week, what we learned in the last session is basically, let's condense it. When you use the word and by itself, it implies a couple of things. It implies, number one, that there is a parallel structure. But number two, it also implies that you have equal and basically independent things. So here's something that we put on the board last week. Let's show up here in a couple of seconds. Here's from, uh, here's from the previous session. So and creates a parallel structure between elements that are presumed independent or sequential, but even if they're in a sequence, they're still you know separate. And then equal in importance or priority. So I like apples, grapes, and bananas is a parallel structure between three foods that I actually like. So here's a food that I like. Here's another food that I like. Here's a third food that I like. Independently of each other, none of these is a description of any of the other ones. We ate dinner, saw a show, then went to a club. These are sequential, but they're basically still separate. Like none of these things are sub functions of any of the other ones or dependent on any of the other ones or components of any of the other ones or so on and so forth. So this is how the word and works. So if you say a truck crashed in front of me on the freeway and I was late to work, if somebody spoke that sentence out loud, what, what they would pretty obviously mean is the truck made me late by crashing in front of me. But in the chat box again, what is the actual implication of the way this is actually written on this page? Like if you actually write, and I was late to work, what's the implication in the chat box? Yeah, they're two independent ideas, right? Two bad things that happen, exactly. So according to this sentence that's right here, these would be independent of each other. So two independent bad things that happened today. And I wasn't, presumably I was not late because of the crash. Like the idea, the implicit idea here is that I was not late because of the crash. There's no cause and effect hypothesized. So to indicate cause and effect, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, two principal ways to indicate actual cause and effect. The first is to use a modifier. So if you have something like a truck crashed in front of me on the freeway, comma, making me late to work. That works. That's a comma ing modifier. We also have a study hall session that deals with those at some point. And then number two, you can also just use an explicit transition word for cause and effect, like thus or therefore or something, or so. So a truck crashed in front of me on the freeway, and so I was late to work. So you have the transition word so in here. That I mean, even though you have the word and, 
and what you achieve by adding in this extra transition word is you accomplish this message. You, you transmit the idea that there is cause and effect. So any questions about this kind of thing? This is a review from last session. If you have any questions about it, please type them in the chat box. Otherwise, we'll start firing up some problems from the text, from, the, from mostly the GMAT prep. So let's talk about this problem right here. Here is a timer. We'll give you a little bit more time than you probably need. Here's a timer. Again, please use the answer buttons to indicate your answer. Please do not just throw an answer in the chat box. All right, so there's a couple of you who don't have answers to this. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Please indicate an answer using those answer buttons. Again, the answer buttons are below the window of names. But I'll give you about 10 more seconds to jump on an answer to this one. Okay, so most people have answers to this. Here are the answers for the class. So we, there's not a ton of agreement here. We've got a slight plurality in favor of D, but there's no majority here. Um, there are three non-responses. I mean, there's this says four, but one of them is me. So if you are one of the non-responses, I know I say this every time, but I need to say it every time. If you are one of the non-responses, be aware that you are not preparing yourself for this test. Like one of the most important things about this test is that you would just have to answer stuff. Even if you are not sure, you still have to produce some sort of answer in due time. So be aware of that. It's a big part of this. It's just producing something. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's take a look at the ands, because that's the theme of today. Here is the word and. This doesn't have an and. This is an and. This is an and. And that's, these things are not and. What's going on, tell me in the chat box, what's going on in B and E here? Like, what are those? What, what's, they replaced and it weighs with a comma plus ing construction. What, what is happening there? Tell me a story about that. Let's see what you say in the chat box. It's a, um, it's not a clause, um, Ash. It doesn't matter if you can name these things, but the name subordinate clause is actually not right because it's not a clause. But names are unimportant, so we should probably not pursue that particular discussion any further. Um, what is, yeah, people are, it, it, it's a modifier, right? It tells us, um, Kamna, maybe you under, maybe you not, maybe you didn't understand what specific question I was asking because you've given an answer that's exactly the opposite of what what I asked. So, but I'll put that up on the board as illustration here. The question that I asked was, what's going on in B and C? Like, like what is the highlighted construction 
in B and E. So maybe someone didn't understand this part of the point, but we're talking about those two. And this is exactly what that does not do. This is what the fun this is not the function of that, and that's exactly what you're supposed to have understood. Because that's not what modifiers do. So this is exactly what yeah, that's what I figured. I figured you had the wrong question, but still it's important to clarify. This is exactly what this construction does not do. This is what and does. This construction is a modifier. It, it, comma ing modifiers what they do is to make a very long story very short. So like a very bare bones summary of these without getting without launching into a huge discussion about them is these modifiers describe in some reasonably direct way the previous action which is also the same as saying that they talk about the previous clause. There's also considerations about the subject of that action and so forth and so on, but then we would be getting dangerously away from the theme of today's class. So previous action. In B and E, that's incorrect because those don't have anything to do with each other. The previous action is this. That's talking about how long it is, and weight doesn't describe length. Like these are different facts. I mean, you might say in a vague sort of way that they're both like facts about how small it is, but they're different dimensions. One of them is length, one of them is weight. You can't really argue in favor of a modifier here. Modifier doesn't work in B and E because weight is not a description or an inevitable consequence of length. So these are just separate dimensions. So you should use and. But more to the point, you should just if you see and, you should say that's more appropriate. I mean, you're, you're not trying to fix the sentence, and it's important that you not put yourself in a frame of mind where you're trying to fix the sentence. But if you see and, you should realize that's appropriate because and connects things that are separate observations, and comma ing explicitly does not. So any questions? Smiley face if you understand this aspect of B and E. So, all right, so let's kill those. There are other things going on, miscellaneous idi idioms and such like, but we'll stay on topic here. So let's take a look at the rest of this. Let's move it on to the next page. Let's black out the answers that we've eliminated. Okay, so B is gone, E is gone. Chat box, what's something else? So we've got the and. So as far as today's theme, that's pretty much the end of the story. Like we have what we need to know about and. The rest of these are all and. Can anybody seize on any other differences among these three choices? I'm type about it in the text box. Okay, so people are talking about um, People are talking about the which modifier, so let's let's go there. There's actually an entire study hall session on this topic, so what I'll do is just very quickly sketch out a discussion of this because this is this is a little bit more complicated than you might think. 
but if you have the following, if you have a construction where it's like a noun plus a preposition plus another noun, comma, which, and let's call these noun one and noun two. In this kind of construction, the, the which can potentially modify either of those nouns. So it doesn't have to be noun two, and I think that's what some of you guys are saying when you say touch rule. It's, it's either noun one or noun two, depending on context. The way that you tell which one it modifies is you use the context of the sentence. So for example, in number 26 of the official guide 12, I can't put the whole problem up there, but I think I'm under fair use by using one fragment of it. So for instance, in the correct answer to official guide 12, number 26, the correct answer has Emily Dickinson's letters to Susan Dickinson, comma, which were. Notice what's going on here. Um, someone is talking about mission critical. I know that's a word that's used somewhere in the strategy guide. I, I actually don't know what that, I don't know what mission critical is. I haven't seen that part of the strategy guide in a while. So we'll have to not use that particular language, like maybe explain it in some other way. Um, this, is, this is noun one, this is noun two, and then that's preposition. But in context, it's, it's clear that um, which is not Susan Dickinson, because number one, it can't be. That would have to be a who anyway. I mean, a person can't be a which. So number one, it's the wrong pronoun. But number two, it's just obvious in context. So here, which refers to letters, and that's OK. So which is letters to Susan Huntington Dickinson, which is that's an acceptable construction. So the, the complaint about C here is probably not as valid as some people think it is, because this is a noun one and a prep and a noun two. This is a camcorder is noun one, prep, noun two. And which is actually the camcorder, so I think we are actually okay there. I mean, it may, if you can do this, this is better, but this is not wrong. And let me just make sure that I articulate that point as well. Make sure you know that there are two kinds of thought processes happening when you do these problems. The first is, is anything right and wrong? And I think that one mistake that a lot of people make is to try to think of everything in terms of straight up right and wrong. Sometimes it's not straight up right and wrong, and sometimes one choice is just way better than the other one, even though the other one is not like 100% wrong. For instance, this is not wrong for the same reason that Susan Huntington Dickinson down here is not wrong. But this is better because it does place camcorder next to which. The reason why it's important to think relatively here is that if this were the only option that you had, then you would have to say, OK, that's not wrong, and I'm not going to eliminate it. But then when it's placed next to a much better option, you're like, OK, I don't want that anymore. It's exactly like anything else. Like if you're trying to buy a pair of jeans, okay, if a pair of jeans doesn't fit you, then it's wrong and you don't buy it. On the other hand, if a pair of jeans fits you and you don't love it, but you don't hate it, then it depends on what other jeans are there. Like if you like it better than all the other jeans, then you buy it. Or if it's the only pair that fits you, then you buy it. But if it's next to a pair that you like much better and that fits you and that is also the same price, then you don't buy it. And this is pretty much the same thing. So this is the pair of jeans that you sort of don't love, but that fits you. And this is the pair of jeans that fits you much more nicely. That's how you want to think about this. 
So that's th there is that which issue, but that's not a basis for elimination. All right, let me read through some of these things that you're saying in the text box here. Um, it's the same as... So Comna's example is, I believe, another example of the same sort of thing that we have on the board here. Um, I definitely don't have the kind of memory where I'm going to remember these examples, but it sounds like an example of the same. So that, okay, so now you can't really use which. The, the end of the very long story here is that which is not a firm basis of elimination here. So let's try this again. How about something else? L let's talk about this and. Versus this and. Does anybody see the difference that's created there? Let's see what you guys go for here. Let's see what you say about this. And, and also, as long as we're at it, let's talk about that one, too. Does anybody see an actual functional difference created by the usage of those two versions of and? see some people typing. Well, you might be typing here for a little bit because this is not a simple question with a short answer. So we'll wait for a little bit. It weighs is pair. Uh, OK, so we're getting at the right thing here. I think it's pronounced seeing. Um, seeing you're getting at the right idea. Um, so let's let's take that and run with that. Seeing points out maybe not the exact specifics that you wrote, but seeing is thinking about, and you should be thinking about this. What parallelism is created? This is a very good thing to think about. It's very important. OK. So um, what parallelism is created? Well, let's take a look at D. This is just ways. Because remember that words that come after these parallel words are definitely included. So this is blah, 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 and weighs less than 11 ounces. What's parallel to weighs? It is. So in choice D, it's another verb, right? So in choice D, we know that we're looking for blah, blah, blah and ways. So in this in this blank right here we need another verb that creates the parallel structure. So that's going to be is. And this is a parallel construction that actually makes sense. Because there are two interesting facts about the small size of this device. Number one, it is as long as whatever. And number two, also interestingly, it weighs x amount. That's the actual parallel structure that is intended here. Like remember, when you talk about parallelism, you should always be able to call the parallel structures A and B, or like X and Y, if you were speaking out loud. So here you can totally do that here. Like this thing, A, is as long as this, and B weighs only this much. This makes perfect sense. Any questions about the parallelism in choice D? Okay, now let's look at choices A and C. The 
parallelism in choices A and C is blah, 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 blah. And it weighs. So what we have here, in order for this to work, this time this guy is actually a complete clause, because we have a subject and a verb. We have it weighs. So to have a parallelism, you need another clause. Where's that clause? Text box. Chat, chat box, whatever you want to call it. Like, what's actually parallel to it weighs in choices A and C? Yeah, it's the main clause, right? It's the electronics company has. Because everything else is modifiers, and you cannot put a modifier in parallel to a clause. So let's take Satish's out of here. And you got this. So choices A and C are saying, weirdly enough, that the electronics company weighs about 11 ounces. It's kind of strange, right? The electronics company has unveiled what it claims to do this. So the electronics company has done this. Modifier, modifier, modifier. And it weighs less than 11 ounces. Well, you're forced to conclude that it is the electronics company. So that's not a reasonable implication. The electronics company weighs less than 11 ounces. That's, that's pretty light for a company. So that's something we're going to look at. And I mean, th this is the other aspect of AND, is that AND creates a parallel structure. And so when you see it, you should not neglect these basic mechanical forms of parallelism. Now remember, when you're looking at a parallel structure, so the, the basic deal here is don't um, forget how parallelism works. Let's type that up there. Don't forget how parallelism works. Meaning that you have to figure out the structure from what follows the signal. All right. Um, move on to another problem here, unless anybody has some quick questions to ask about this one. But this is not simple. So what this implies is that when you see the word and, you can't let your guard down and say, oh, that's so easy, it's the word and. I mean, you may wind up hunting cross-sentence for your other half of your parallel structure, and you have to go find it. So there it is. All right. Let's move on. Let's look at another problem here. How about this one? Um, yeah, it, I mean, we just got done explaining why A and C are wrong. So the answer is D. Um, sorry for not explicitly saying that. These are incorrect. OK, let's try this. Clear out your answers. This problem is nice and short, so I'll give you less time. Um, as a reminder, please use the answer buttons. Here's a timer. OK, there's still quite a few of you without answers here, so I'll give you about 15 more seconds. But this is a short problem. That means you shouldn't be spending very long. Huh?
Okay, there's a Holdino, there's a Shrushti, Shrushti just answered it, okay, there's a Benita. If you guys have not answered the problem, that means you got to get on it. Remember that it's the GMAT, you're not allowed to abstain. Here are your responses as a class. All right, so there's a not quite, it looks like a majority, because I, I mean, it counts me as one of the non-responders, so this is a very slight majority. Um, in favor of E. But let's go ahead and take a look. The theme of today is the word and. Admittedly, the word and is only in this problem once. But still, it's once. Still worth talking about. So let's talk about that. How does that work? Chat box. Just the and. Like if you're gonna, if, so don't write about other mistakes at the moment. We'll we'll wait on that. Yeah, what we're implying is that there's not really a relationship. So Karen, that's what I was saying. Like don't go there yet. Like just the and. Let's just talk about that right now. Um, it it doesn't make sense because these are not separate facts. I mean, there's two things going on here. The two facts about this worm or moth or whatever it is they talk about. It, it, number one, it's a critical source of fat. And then number two is the bears like find a whole bunch of them under the rocks. So this thing is a critical source of fat. Number two fact is that the bears like go hunting for ridiculous numbers of the of them. So okay. These are not independent. I mean, one of them is, is kind of an extension or a, a, an explanation or a detail about the other one. These are not independent observations. Number one is the reason or rationale for number two. So therefore, and is not really an appropriate connector. So what what is actually going on here? Well, it's, so you don't want that. We'll talk about pronouns and stuff in a second. What about comma ing? As long as we are talking about comma ing in the last problem. Does anybody know how that works? Let's have a digression here. If it says comma overturn ing, who does the overturning? Here are two examples. Let's look at these two examples. First example, Matt's sister um, slapped him, comma, angering the children's father. And then the other example would be Matt was slapped by his sister, angering the children's father. Okay. Let's talk about who made who mad in this in these problems. Like who I mean in, in both cases we're talking about the same action. Yeah, Matt's sister said pow across the face or whatever. 
But what's the difference between these two sentences? Let's see if any of you guys can explain briefly in the text box. Um, they are active and passive, but that's not really you know, an important determinant of anything. Yeah, seeing, if you guys look in the text box at what seeing and J are saying, when you have comma ing modifiers, the idea is that the agent of that action, like the, the ultimate thing or person who actually makes that ing action happen, is the subject. So that has to be the ultimate source of the ing action. So the subject of the previous clause should be the source or agent or doer of the action described in the ing form. So comma angering in this case is talking about Matt's sister because that's the subject. So that's the action clause, whatever you want to say. So this, the implication here is that the dad was mad at Matt's sister for hitting him. Versus the implication in the second sentence is comma angering refers to Matt himself. So the implication here is that dad was mad at Matt, like presumably for being hit by a girl or something like that. There's a very different meanings here. Like they're describing the action that is ultimately the same, but the the modifier is talking about the the generator of that action. So there's different things here about. Um, the user as RA, um, if you're talking about something called possessive poison, that's something that you do not have to use ever. And in fact, that the official people have edited out of the most recent editions of their books. So we should probably not pursue that thread. So notice this also makes C incorrect. Because according to choice C, who's overturning rocks? the moth is, right? Because this is kind of like Matt's sister slapped him angering the children's father, so subject is the moth. So according to that modifier, the moth is overturning the rocks. That doesn't really make any sense. So there you go. Um, questions about that. What about the remaining choices? Well, how about this? When you see that kind of difference, you should definitely be thinking about whether that pronoun is acceptable. Because like if you see a pronoun replaced by a noun, that is an extremely strong hint. Like these guys are pretty good at not leaving a trail most of the time. But if you see them take a pronoun out and put a noun in its place, then they're in almost all cases are trying to correct a pronoun that is not legit. I mean, there's going to be exceptions to everything. But if you see this happen, you should very strongly suspect that the pronoun has issues. So if you see a pronoun taken out and replaced by a specific noun, you should strongly suspect that the pronoun is incorrect. Although you should still check. You should still check you with pronoun rules. So in A, you have a them. Who is them supposed to be in choice A? 
is what Karen was saying before when we were having the discussion about another topic. Like, who is this supposed to refer to? It's supposed to be the moth, and that's not legit because the moth is singular. So, like, this is intended to mean moths, but it can't because moths is it's not, it's, there's no plural word there. Moth appears as the singular form. Um, what, what you shouldn't really waste your time doing is the following. Let me put, I, I don't mean to make an example of anyone here, but um, just, just a quick, d don't waste your time doing this, but it refers to bears. There's, there's no reason to assign a pronoun that is incorrect. Like, when you think about a pronoun, what you should just do is say, what should it stand for? And can it stand for that? So what should this stand for? It's supposed to be moths. Moth is not plural, so you're done. There's no reason to look at bears. There's no reason to look at rocks. There's no reason to look at any other plural noun, because the noun that you want is not there. So in other words, what I'm saying, I'm going to go ahead and delete this from the slide in a second, but this part of the thought process is a complete and total waste of time. Because as soon as you figure it out that moths is the intended thing here, then, oh, look, it doesn't say moths. Done. Incorrect. So a lot of people do this. A lot of people frantically hunt through other nouns trying to assign the pronoun. But why would you do that? I mean, if it doesn't assign to where you want it to go, it's wrong. All right, let's get that off the board. Um, B is not a sentence. I mean, you can't, uh, uh, in, in brief, a semicolon is like a period. And after a semicolon, you would have to have another sentence. So this overturning rocks is a fragment. Fragments are not sentences, so this is not OK. And then we can cross this one out in green because of the pronoun issue. So we've got E. There's, there's one issue regarding um, the insect and stuff, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, there's a question here that let's let's address this really quickly. Does the comma ing ever address um, the touching noun? Let's address that question. Let me put it on the board. Okay, there's that. So Dilip's question, I think I'm pronouncing that right. Dilip, Dilip, I'm not exactly sure how to say that. But I think it's something like that. Um, there's the question. The answer is, if it follows a clause, then no. But if it just follows a noun and doesn't follow a clause, then yes. So if the modifier actually comes after a clause, then no. But if it just follows a noun and doesn't follow a clause, then yes, it can. And here's an example of that. If you say, like, the two injured birds, comma, flapping their wings frantically. Sorry about the noise in the background. I'm outside right now. Flapping their wings frantically, comma, searched for a safe place to land. This is a correct sentence. Like, there's no danger of any issues with this modifier, because there is no clause. So you can't talk about modifying a clause, because there isn't one. 
So in this case, the flapping their wings frantically is definitely talking about the birds, and that's totally legit. So Delip, I hope that clears that up. OK. Um, let's look at the other question that was in there before, which was, let's go ahead and get the correct answer here, because that's what the question was about. So let me see how I can work some magic here. Let's get that to go away. So that is grizzly bears, which overturned the rocks to find the bears. OK, this is your correct answer choice here. The question, I know the 40,000 got a little bit cut off here, but that's fine. I think you guys get the point. So the question that a couple of people asked, um, it looks like C. Ying has found an example of this. Let's go back to that really quick. Um, that's impressive. C. Ying, how did you find that example? Like, did you have it bookmarked under some kind of topic, or is it? Oh, well, I mean, I know it's in a question, and it's one of the official guide questions. But like, how did you find it? Like, did you have a bookmark? Did you have it bookmarked under comma ing or something like that, or is your memory just that ridiculous? I mean, that's that's a pretty amazing skill of memory if you just remember it. Okay, I mean, well, I'm I'm flattered that you remember my post. I mean, I mean, I don't want to talk about this forever, but I'm, what I'm wondering is how you remember that particular question right off the top of your head, presuming you've read hundreds of posts. I mean, that means you're. I mean, that's pretty amazing to me. But anyway, let's go back to this. The question that was being asked by a couple of people earlier was this modifier. How do we know what this is talking about? The question is basically, is that a reference to bears or, or to rocks or to insects? So does anybody have a satisfactory answer to that? I mean, notice the problem doesn't depend on this, but still, it's important to be able to address this sort of thing. Um, the peanut gallery is kind of quiet right now, but let's see if anybody has an answer to this. So Nikita says, I mean, we're, hopefully you're going to not just tell me an answer. Hopefully you'll give me some sort of explanatory comment. I mean, yes, it's insects, sorry, but why? Like, how do you know that is the real question. I mean, how do you use modifiers? Like, if you really had to summarize modifiers in one sentence, like all modifiers, can anybody give me a one sentence summary of how basically just about all modifiers work? Like, what what is the main mission of a modifier or, like, the deal? It gives information, and then, like, where do you put it? Well, I'm looking at all modifiers as close to the, that's the point, right? As close as possible to the stuff that you are actually talking about. So basic principle of modifiers is that modifiers go as close as possible to the stuff that they are describing. So, I mean, the insect is right there and makes perfect sense. So we can infer. And I mean, there is a lot of inferring of this kind that goes on with modifiers, because if there were not, it would take like 500 million zillion words to say anything. 
So, you know, it's, it's the same thing with which being okay with noun one or noun two on the earlier slide. I mean, if, if it weren't, then think how much gymnastics you would have to do to say anything. You yeah, know, so we're talking about the insects. And the very, very basic principle upon which basically every modifier works is that you put it as close as possible to stuff. And then as far as this, um, there's also common sense. I mean, the sentence is about moths. It's about the cutworm moth. OK, like it would be really weird and schizophrenic if, if, if the author chose to ignore the moth in order to describe the number of rocks that the bear overturns. I mean, that just wouldn't make any sense. Because like sentences have to be about things in a way that makes sense. So like th this is a sentence about this moth. So if you're going to have something like 40,000 of these per bear, well, you know, that's going to be by default. We're still talking about this moth. But more to the point, if you see this kind of modifier, then it's going to talk about the stuff that's next to it. That's the idea. So. OK. Um, seeing, not really, those are basically the same. Um, I eat as many as 5,000 calories per day, and I eat up to 5,000 calories per day are basically the same. So there's not really a meaning difference there. Those are, those are two ways to say basically the same thing. OK, if you have any other quick questions, throw them in the text box. If not, we will put another problem up on the board and have fun with it. OK, let's look at another one. About this one. Okay. Please use the answer buttons. I'll give you a timer. Have fun. Okay, there are still a number of you who have not picked an answer, so I'm looking at you, Matt, I'm looking at you, Nikki Perry, and I'm looking at you, Aris, Aris, please pick something. All right, let's take a look. Um, here are your class statistics. Uh, where are they? There they are. Okay. So we have a plurality of C's. It's not a majority by any script or by any script. What am I talking about? It's not a majority by any means, but it's a plurality. Let's see. Well, there's an and in choice B and choice E, which is the tie in to today's theme. That's an and. That's another and. Someone in the text box tell me a story about those ands. Like, is that legit? Is that not legit? Et cetera. All right, someone's talking. There we were. Uh, we were. Um, yeah. Um, Ray, I don't know what is that supposed to be legit. If it is, and legit has an e in it, but I don't know what what the word that's supposed to be. But yeah, not Karen says not independent. It's basically the idea. Um, and even if that is legit, I'm not sure exactly what 
what you mean by that. But let's talk about the and. The and implies independent. Um, independent. These things are not independent. Because the second part, which is, you know, the northern and southern Indian alphabets, come from here, is a description or additional information about the Aramaic script. So therefore, and doesn't make sense. So that's one way in which you can eliminate these. You can also um, you can also use the fact, maybe Ray, I think this might be what you were talking about. You can't do this. Like which actually has to introduce a clause with a like if you say from which or to which or in which, you actually have to have a clause after that. So you have from which or to which or according to whom or etc. You actually need a legitimate clause with a subject and verb. That's what I mean. That's what makes something a clause. That's redundant to say that. But so if you say, for instance. Um, this um, on on the on the counter is a large box in which found most of my store coupons. On the counter is a large box in which are found most of my store coupons. On the counter is a large box in which you can find most of my store coupons. Okay, let's evaluate. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys yes or no options here. You're going to see your A through E go away, and you're going to see red X and green check. So for each of these, go ahead and tell me if it's right or not right. On the counter is a large box in which found most of my store coupons. Green check if that's correct. Red X if that's not correct. This should not be a time consuming decision. So please pick green check or red X. Those are where the A through E used to be. So if you are Aris or Ash or CC or Comna, you should pick one. This, this, this needs to be a decision that you can make fairly quickly. So now Aris, Ash, CC, are we dropping out of the game? Okay. Here are your results. Um, mostly identified as incorrect. You guys are right. This is incorrect. The reason why it's incorrect is because this is not a clause. Like you don't, you can't say in which found. Like this doesn't have a subject. So this is incorrect. That's the same reason why this one's incorrect up here. It's the same problem. You can't say from which verb ing because that's not legit. What about this one? Green check red X. On the counter is a large box in which are found most of my store coupons. Everybody pick green check red X, please.
Okay, there's still a couple of dropouts here, but I mean, you guys, can, you guys, remember, you cannot not answer things on this test. If you're here in the session, you should be answering the problems. But so people are split on this. The slight majority is correct. This is okay. It's a little bit of a tricky construction, but let's talk about what's happening here because you do have. I mean, this is what's going on in A, C, and D. You can have a subject that comes after the verb, sure. So if you have, you know, I mean, there's reverse construction. In other words, subject after verb. Sure, there are lots of sentences that are like this. The most simple example I can think of is there is or there are. Like there is one car in the driveway. There are two cars in the driveway. I mean, the subject is not there because there is not a noun, so it can't be the subject. Like there is a is an adverb. It's it's describing is. So the subject of these verbs is is the cars that follow them. I mean, in other words, this is grammar wise, this is the same as one car is there in the driveway, but it's used differently meaning wise. So your subject here is one car, your subject here is two cars. It's not just there is, there are. I mean, any any time the stuff in front of the verb can't be a subject, then your subject is behind. So if you say on the beach was a single pigeon hunting for food versus on the beach were two pigeons hunting for food. These are both correct as well because on the beach is not a subject. To modify a prepositional phrase, I mean those things can't be subjects. So here's a verb. Here's a verb. The subjects are not on the beach. So the subjects are this: single pigeon, two pigeons. So that's the construction that is going on here. Are found is the verb. And most of my store coupons is the subject. This is actually, you can say, in which most of my store coupons are found. This is actually the same construction. So, in which are found the, these things. Importantly, that's the same construction that is used in all of these remaining answers, one of which has to be the correct one. So, this is, you have the from which, that's a verb. That's a verb. That's a verb. And then here you have subjects. So that's going to be a subject. That's going to be, I mean, that's, that's an incorrect form, so we don't need to look at B. This is the subject. This is the subject. So it's a lot like R found most of my store coupons. And then the last one, I don't think we need to do the survey. I think you guys know that the last one is correct. So there. But this this one's also correct. The one in the middle. It's got a backward construction kind of like those examples down there. This is what you'll find in sentence correction. What you'll find in sentence correction is if you get confused by a longer construction, you can usually figure it out by appeal to shorter and simpler things. And like one mistake that I see on the forums a lot is people who want really complicated examples of things. So it's this weird problem where they don't understand something because it's complicated and they're like, give me a really complicated example. Well, not what you need. Like if you are surprised by the subject coming after the verb here, what you need is not another equally complicated example. What you need is something really simple, like there are two cars in a driveway. And you can be like, oh, OK, I get it. That makes sense. That's easy. And now let me expand that sort of reasoning to this more general situation. So make sure that you don't jump at the most complicated examples of everything that you can find. Like if you're having any trouble with a construction, the very, very first thing that you should do is go back to basics. Like keep it simple. Don't don't go crazy with stuff. So there's the deal. 
Any questions about all this with the in which, according to whom, whatever, all that kind of stuff? If you have just which, then which is the subject. It's still a clause, but which itself is the subject. But if you say in which, or of which, or to which, or from whom, according to whom, then you need an actual subject and verb. And in B, you don't have that. Questions, type them. Um, otherwise, does anybody know how you can kill A and D? Yeah, it's subject verb in agreement. Um, bringing, um, how is bringing the clue? Karen, if you could tell me more about that, I would be interested in hearing about it. Because um, I don't see anything obvious about bringing. So. Well, okay, you're talking about verb tenses. There's nothing wrong with a past tense because this stuff did happen in the past. I mean, you can look at this in one of two ways, and that's the, this is the problem with verb tenses is that a lot of the time it depends on the, the perspective that you're taking on the situation. Because like here we're talking about an alphabet that comes from other alphabets. And there's two ways in which you can look at that. The first is you can say historically some people once upon a time like actually made these alphabets from that one. In which case you actually would want the past tense. You would actually want was derived. I mean you would want were derived. But I mean you, you would want that tense. On the other hand, you could also take the perspective of hey, these are alphabets that still exist. So I, I can speak about them in the present, you know, to emphasize that these are existing items, but I'm talking about their origins. So in that case, from which derive or derive would, would make sense. These are both fine. So it's kind of like saying tortillas are, are made from corn, because, you know, people still make tortillas. Tortillas were first made from corn, or were made from corn, also makes sense if you are talking about the historical event of, whoa, somebody made tortillas for the first time. So the, the, you can't use the tense to eliminate. That, that's incorrect. Also, if you think bringing is the present tense, then that's hugely wrong. So not to... Um, not to harp on that for too long, but INGs don't have a tense at all. Like INGs just adopt whatever the tense is that they're attached to. So if you think that ING is a present tense, number one, no, it's not. And also, number two, it can't be because we're talking about the 5th century BC. So there's no way this could be the present tense. So. Okay, but back to the main elimination here. I mean, what, you, what you've got to notice is the splits here. When you have a difference that is this stark, was, derive, derives, you, you cannot afford to let that go. So if any of you guys are using verb tenses and stuff instead of that, that's a really, really bad mistake. Because this is a very binary, very straightforward kind of split. And verb tenses are extremely complicated and subtle and perspective dependent. So that's not good prioritizing. This is singular, this is plural, and this is singular. So you've got to use that. It's like 0 or 1, the light bulb is off or the light bulb is on. And in this case, the subject is, is something plural. It's multiple alphabets. So not singular verb and not singular verb. So in other words, don't let your attention flit all over the place. Make sure you prioritize. Don't miss obvious or binary splits. Um, also, the other aspect of prioritizing 
is that verb tense is a minor topic. It is not nearly as important as things like parallelism and agreement issues and modifier placement and pronouns and so on. And as you've seen in this problem, verb tense is also very subtle and very, you know, it's not as well defined nor objective as these other things are. So verb tense should basically be priority Z if all these other things are priority A. Like you should not really put much thought into verb tense until you have fully mastered parallelism, pronouns, and so on. Um, let's talk about this difference here that we haven't uh, seen. We haven't discussed this yet. Does anybody want to elaborate on that? See what you guys write. There's a bunch of people typing. Yeah, you guys are on this. Um, not TTW, but everybody else is getting the point here. Um, it's not TTW, no. I mean, it is. Um, it can still be the, the empire, even though the empire is not right next to it. In fact, pronouns would be pretty much useless if they had to modify what was right next to them. But it's not a pronoun issue. The issue is, again, what's the number one principle of all modifiers? Is that they should be close to, I mean, one thing that I think a lot of people don't appreciate is that you can solve like up to half of all modifier issues by just applying this single number one principle, which is you should put the modifier as close as possible to the stuff that it's talking about. That's it. So if you see something like this, where in A and B it's farther away, and in C, D, E it's closer, then C, D, and E are better. You know, you, you want the Aramaic script here. These, these things are talking about the script. So if script is at the end, then there you go. I mean, touch rule, again, be careful with being overzealous about a touch rule, because that can get you in trouble. Like, where is the problem about, uh, about Emily Dickinson? I was in here. I mean, a lot of people are very much overzealous about the touch rule and get in trouble for that reason. Like here, it's it's this one. Um, okay, like this is not strictly speaking a touch rule. Like which doesn't touch letters, but this is still fine. So uh, be careful with that. Jay Sheng, I don't remember seeing your name before, so maybe you just logged in recently. But the, the, the touch rule, quote unquote, is not as simple as it, as, it might, as it might seem at first. I mean, you have to introduce it in that kind of simplistic form, but that's just an introduction. That's not the all there is to it. Um, we got to run here in a second. There's one more question about this deriving problem, which is this, let's go back to that uh, here. Okay. Um, 
The other question asked about this is C Ying is asking about the difference between what's the difference between derive and R derived. Um, this is one of the few verbs whose meaning is largely the same in either voice. This is one of very few verbs whose meaning isn't very different between active and passive forms. In other words, like this is I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit different, and I'll try to tell you what the difference is. X derives from Y means that Y is the source of X, which is a general statement of fact. Like, for instance, um, I don't know, like yeah, sugar derives from sugar cane. All right. On the other hand, if X is derived from Y, um, like other passive voices, but so you can also say something like uh, the species X derives from species Y, like through evolution or something like that. The difference with the passive voice is like other passive voices, it's restricted to cases where literally it's done by someone or something else. So why, like, this is actually performed usually by people. So it's okay to say sugar derives from, sugar is derived from sugar cane, because that's true. I spelled sugar wrong. I'll fix that. But species X is derived from species Y. Most probably false, unless this is done in some like genetic engineering lab. So unless you are talking about like literally making species in a lab. So that's that's probably more explanation than you would want there, but that's that's the deal. So let me fix sugar. So both of these work in this case. Um, that that's the best that I can do there. Are they going to test you on this? I doubt it. Like notice that they made this a really stark difference of subject verb agreement. Presumably so that you don't have to know subtle little differences like this. I mean, you'll find that almost every little difference like this, I mean, they're illuminating, they're interesting, I think they're fun because I like words, but you'll all, you also notice that most of these, of these differences are completely unnecessary to solve the problems. So it's good to not, it's good to not get off topic here, basically. Um, we got to run, um, we got to finish here, there's not really much of a time. <coughs> Excuse me, there's not really much of a time buffer today. So um, if you have admin questions that can literally fit in the next 20 or 30 seconds, then fire away. Otherwise, good night and good luck sort of thing. Um, thank you for attending. Love you all. Um, we will see you again in a couple of weeks. Probably going to do something quant next time. You guys are welcome. Um, have a wonderful couple of weeks. And I'm going to go ahead and log you out. Good night and good luck. Thank you.